Hey, you're listening to Nervous Rex, and I'm here with Alex Ebert, and I didn't bring my proper equipment, so we're doing this on my iPhone, but you don't mind. No, I think that's cool. It's charming. It's charming. It's kind of rustic. I was going to say it's retro, but it's on an iPhone, so it's not retro. It's futuristic, yet kind of grimy. Right. It's gr- yeah, yeah, exactly. You know I mean? Recent school. Yeah, yeah <laughs> recent school. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so we're, we're here to... Well, we'll talk about a lot of stuff. We were just talking about like LA and the uh, the energy field here. We could get into all that woo woo stuff. But uh, you have a new album, which is what was the final title? Uh, I vs I. I vs I. Yeah. And you're rapping. Yeah. I love it. I rap, as you know. Yes. Um, I've known your music since I'm a robot, and obviously Edward Sharp, Magnetic Zeros. <laughs> so do you. Uh, you grew up listening to rap. It sounds like it. That's it. Yeah, rap, man. Right. That was it. Yeah, I didn't even understand. Uh, I wasn't aware of other shit. Where you grew up in LA? Yeah, in the valley. That's how you know Brian Ling, who got me here, who introduced us. I don't think I met Brian in the oh, valley through business. Oh, Brian, you could talk oh, through the valley through Barsman. <laughs> through Barsman. Yeah, I knew him from the valley. Oh. Right. So the um, valley brought us together. The, the valley brought us together. That's Brian Ling yeah. in the background, who's your manager, correct? Yeah. And uh, a good friend of mine. That's how I know you. And you yeah. and I have been, you know, this is probably the most we'll ever talk one-on-one. We always would just see each other out and do the psych joke on each other. <laughs> and I remember I'd do it to it. Like, I remember people would be like, <laughs> and I'd come up and be like, what's up? And psych, people would be like, dude, you psyched. Did you know him? And I'd be like, no, I don't even know. Uh, <laughs> people thought it was hilarious. That psyched joke. Yeah, that shit. yeah fucks me up yeah well, you yeah. were good you got me a couple times i got you once yeah. i got you once good but you yeah. got me like 85 <laughs> times really good <laughs> there's something so funny about so we're talking about like when you go up to somebody like hey man what's up and then you psych and you pull your hand away there's something you just feel like you're in third grade again when you <laughs> how get did you psych. how did you even remember the psych me and my friends started bringing it back in our adult life and we we're like dude this is so funny and dumb so i just brought it into like this world. yeah I forgot, like the funny thing about the psych thing is it's one of those things, it's one of those things that's like baked into your psyche as, psyche. Like, as like a nervous, like preteen. Yeah. And then someone would psych you and it just fucked you up. Yeah. And you're like, oh my God, like I'm not like, it, like I just got fucking so, it's, there's really no harder burn than what's up bro, psych. Yeah, you just feel, and you got your hand out and you just feel so <laughs> it's dumb. So it's so funny, <laughs> especially as an adult, it's so immature, uh, but that's what makes it so funny. And the and amount it, of times I've come up to you, you'd be in like the back, the back of the yeah. car, you roll down the window, Eber, what's up, bro? And I'd be like, oh, what's up? And I'd come aside and drive off. I'd be standing there like, oh, yeah, fuck. drive, drive by sight. You just get burned in front of your friends. Like, Who was that? <laughs> really funny. Uh, All right. So cool. So yeah, I got to listen to the album. Uh, it's uh, it's cool to hear you rap. I dig it. And, and you produced everything? Yeah. Uh, what yeah. did you make it on? Because I like the production sounds. I want to take a guess because I produce a little yeah. too. I, do I hear, is it Vintage Machines by any chance? Is there an SP the drum machine? The only Vintage Machine on there is a, an ASRX. Oh, it's an ASRX. Okay, yeah. I could tell it was some type of old drum machine yeah. by the, the sound of the drums you yeah. used. It yeah. was uh, not just the sequencer, but the actual sound the actual sounds, sounded yeah. like that uh, 80s kind of like open reverby teeny yeah. drum kit yeah, yeah. that was sort of the constant of the album, which yeah. I loved because I like making beats on the old retro machine. So. Yeah. I jumped right in. I was like, oh, this Dude, is my those new Those new beat machines, I tried to get, I, I can't even, I can't fuck with it. Like, yeah. I'll mess with loops, but like the new beat machines, I just like the, I like being able to like, here's the pads, they're in the thing. Yeah. Even the MPC for me, like the new MPC is having to do, do sample banks and drag right. them in and do all that. Right. I don't know. So what did you mix the, uh, okay, so you use the ASR X or the 10, which one? ASR X. ASR X, yeah, yeah. My buddy used to have it. The red one? Was yeah. It red? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so what did you, did you do that with a computer for the samples and you mixed everything? No, so those samples would be in, they were just like the, the samples that came with the ASR. So wait, all the music that's on the, uh, from not the all the drums, drums. Okay. not okay. all the drums. So okay. some of the drums I would chop up. I made a couple drums, uh, on my fucking iPhone, like on, um, right. like some beat maker, yada, yada bullshit. Like, um, I think it was. Machine, machine. Yeah, oh, I machine. Yeah, uh, I yeah, use that machine. little drum machine. Yeah, yeah. Dude, I, I like the sound. It's going to be kind of parallel to this podcast as yeah, this is yeah. on an iPhone. Yeah. Um, and uh, so, where did you did you do it in New Orleans where you live? Yeah, you almost it? all in New Orleans. Yeah. So you live in New Orleans. Yeah. How's that? 
Dude, it's the best. Yeah, I love it. It's the there. best fucking place. My dad's from New Orleans. City. Really? I never I found that out recently. I thought he was from Atlanta my whole life, and I was with him. I took acid with my dad about six months ago. We tripped together, and I don't know my dad that well. We took LSD, and he told me all this shit I never knew, and he's from a trailer park in New Orleans. I was like, oh, uh, dude. And I love it out there, and I always felt this connection to New Orleans, and I remember you moved there. I'm like, dude, I totally get why he moved there. This place is magic. You yeah. know, it's a whole different... It's like grimy, but beautiful, and the food and the people, and there's yeah. just something special about that place. Yeah. You've been there a few years? I've been there eight years. Okay, yeah, it's a few years. No, it's like, um, I mean, coming from coming from LA, and then, you know, LA's got culture, but it's all, it's like, you know, that, that, that vibe we were talking about, where you land, and it's just like this frenetic fucking possibility thing happening. Right. You go to New Orleans, it's like this this like oozing wet mother who's like giving birth to jazz or something. Yeah. It's like slower and more, more sort of earthy. So, yeah. Anyway. And uh, humid. It's, it's just slow down humid, there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's old. The history of it. You feel it when you walk through. It's like LA isn't old. There's not a lot of history here. I mean, kind of, yeah. but not compared to New Orleans and the, and the, uh, yeah, sort of the French colonial like buildings left over. Like it feels like you're back in time somewhere, you know? Yeah. When I grew up in the Valley, I remember my, my my mom gave me this uh, story that was like um, that I wrote. Once upon a time, there was a kid with a big, with a big, big dick? strong, oh. big dick. Yeah, I was, like, I was five years old. I was really, <laughs> I was on it. No, once upon a time, there was a, b- a boy with, with a big strong crew. Um, and uh, and this whole like from an early age, like all I really wanted to do was fucking have like a like a little tight community thing and and when i remember like i watched pinocchio and fucking like weird fucking cartoons and their depictions of cities and and town life and and i never and growing up in the valley it's just all this fucking open landscape like gangsterfied landscape and it was dope and i loved it but when i saw new orleans for the first time when i was like you know 18 or something i was just like okay i've been to disneyland and this reminds me of that, like the fake city thing, but this is actually real. Like, right. I've never been Studio City fucking like Studio City. What's that called? Like City Walk. Right. That's the closest to like yeah, culture, like a, facade, right? like a fake building. A facade right. was right. the closest to the real thing I'd ever been. Yeah, that's a trip. That's what I mean. Like you go there and it's like, is this a movie set or is this real? And yeah. it's real. Yeah. And yeah, the music vibe there and the history. Yeah, that place is cool. So I imagine. But it's interesting because I hear this album and I don't hear as much New Orleans in it. It feels like no. more you as a kid growing up in L.A. kind yeah, of yeah. hip hop influence yeah. than the music I've heard you put out out of New Orleans. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. yeah, the uh, the song that I loved is uh, Miracle. Yeah. Like, that's the one. Is that really your kid on there? Do you have a yeah, child? Yeah. Do you have a baby human? I have a little baby human. Uh, that's why I moved out to New Orleans, because um, we didn't want to raise I, a kid in LA. They end up like us. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, so, how old is your baby human? <laughs> She's seven. Okay, so that was her going to, and then you kind of do this birds and the bees thing, but not birds and the bees. It's more like this is what happens when you die. You become food for the roses. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Something Uh, like that. We, uh, uh, we're all, uh, Jesus Christ. But you know what I'm saying? It's a line about we're basically the cycle of life. Yes. You're telling your kid this. I wish I remember that rap, that line right now. You know, I wrote it down. Let me pull it up real Um, quick. um, Uh, I wrote it down. Uh, it is. Feed the roses. Yeah, Yeah, there it is. Then my my, my, my daughter asks, Papa, why do we die? Ooh, I think she felt my suicide. Yeah. Interesting yeah. topic to bring up. Uh, so everyone gets so weird about that. I like that you went there. And the monogamy yeah, line. Of- I said, yes, babe, just like you and I. Right. She said, yeah, but do the blue in our eyes vanish just like the blue in sky when the night come to strip our view of light? I said, damn, that's deep. I held it tight. I said, yes, babe. We decompose to feed the roses. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, that was a great bar. Yeah. yeah, I could tell you listen, when I heard that little section, I was like, oh, he's a hip hop head. Like this isn't just, cause some people might listen to this and be like, oh, he's trying to do a rap album. But yeah. when you really listen, like, oh, he grew up listening to rap, like yeah, the yeah. bars and everything. It's like, yeah. I remember a few <laughs> years ago, you did a song that might've been the precursor to this. You played me a song that he sure. did. Yes, and it was you rapping. I was like, what? It's like, dude, he could rap. Like, yeah. it was so cool to hear. He sent me a video of you listening to that song oh, like, really? on the road in the car or yeah. someone. Yeah, I remember that. So was that. So when you did that song, was that kind of you just having fun? And then you're like, wait, I should do a rap album. Now, that was me being like, dude, ever, you know, ever since I found out I was white, um, I was like, that, was like I was like 18. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. I was like, okay, yeah, I can't really do that. Right. right. <laughs> um, like, like, I'm going to try singing or whatever. But then, but then I... Like when that thing came around, I was like, fuck, man, I, 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 
like I need to re-embrace this because sometimes you just have too many words you want to say. They won't yeah. fit into like a melody and it's better to just yeah. like say it. Get it out when you read it out. Yeah. Um, um, so that song was me like dipping my toe back into back into hip hop for a second. Yeah, no, I, I really like yeah. it. And I, uh, you know, I know you obviously were, you, you know, you're in the music industry, so you rub shoulders with all these big rappers and you know, people in the music industry. Um, have is no no collabs on the album no you didn't want to did anyone did you think about no, I was just I did but then I just felt like the collab thing for me in that zone I was in it was such a personal zone yeah. and I was like in post breakup with baby mama and it was yeah. just like it was just a vibe I was trying to do and at that point a collab felt like a like a business move or right, something. Right, you know right. I mean? Yeah, you're right. No, I, I like that you didn't. It's more you and yeah, you're right. It almost would come off like, oh, I got co-signed by right, so-and-so. Right, so. right, like, right. Approve of me as a rapper. It's kind of better. Yeah. You just went rogue and solo. Um, yeah, so, and also another song that, forgive you guys hear that I'm touching the phone because I wrote questions. Um, uh, are you really a jealous guy? Because there's yeah. a song about- Yeah, no, that is, that's me covering that song. I mean, that's oh, my it's cover a real song. of who? Of the John Lennon song. Well, oh, you meant you're covering up the fact that you're really just. So, <laughs> oh, it's a real song by John Lennon. Was he in a music group I've heard of? Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, the Beatles. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. Um, I know. I, I think I'm. I think I'm jealous. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I, okay, I, can't you be, I can't be jealous. It's something that I'm. That I've like worked. I've worked through. You know what I mean? Right. Um, how did you? How do you work through? I, I think I just gotten older, and you kind of don't care as much because I used to be real jealous. I think it depends on the girl. Yeah. But I've been super possessive and jealous, and then I've been totally open where it's like I'm cool. Like yeah. it's weird. Well, dude, I'll tell you a story. It's super personal. I've never told anyone in public. The first time I had sex, I was 14. The girl was 13, and my parents were out of town, and all these sort of like older gangsters were also at my place, like taking advantage, and like we were having parties. But they were like, you know like in this gang and they were hanging and they were like 18 and we were all 14 and they're getting drunk and whatever. And I had this girl come over and I bring her up into my place. My friends are like watching through the window and I have sex with her, but I was so inculcated with the idea of what like, does that word mean? like a baked into my brain. In- inculcated? Inculcated. Oh, okay. With the idea of like AIDS. Oh because yeah, like it was the 80s? Back, the 90s. Like 90s. Right. And, and I was just like, so anyway, I, we ha- I had a condom on, but right after I had sex with her, um, I ran downstairs and took like a 30 minute shower with Ooh. hydrogen peroxide. Because you thought you were gonna get your yeah, yeah. AIDS scare was on. Yeah, yeah, I was just like, oh wow. shit. So I ran down, I did that. By the time I came back up, she was fucking someone. What? She was, fu- she was fucking one of the dudes. One of the gangsters? One of the gangsters in the other. No, the other did it, and you got jealous, obviously. It's not that I got jealous, but what I'm realizing now is that that was my f- mo- foremost, oh. most formative experience with sex. That was my first experience right, with right. sex. And what I didn't experience, I didn't fear experience total jealousy. I experienced like, just like the raw goods of whatever yeah. underneath jealousy, fear, whatever the fuck Yeah, it is. God, that's a quick turnaround from like, end of my virginity to like, you yeah. fucking so, like you yeah, thought you're, you're so special. Immediately and, fucking yeah. someone else. So like, <laughs> so sorry was, to laugh. No, 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 it's not, it, it's all good. But I think that I just figured out that there was a connection between like, whatever the fuck, you know, my experience with relationships has been and that moment. Just now or when you wrote, I'm just, oh no, no in the last, I literally just realized in the last like, m- like month and a half. Wow. Yeah. There's so many things that you realize are things from your childhood that are like either suppressed that come up later and you're like, oh my God, you're like, that was yeah. the reason why this, and yeah. it's all of a sudden it's just so clear and you're like, it's interesting when that moment happens yeah. and it could take 30 fucking years. Yeah. Yeah. It's so strange. Yeah. Um, yeah. Someone recently said like, were you ever like molested as a child? And I'm like, I don't think so, but it's possible that I blocked it out yeah. because people always say you have these traumas that are suppressed. So yeah. I'm really like, I'll lay in bed. I'm like, did something happen? And I'm just not remembering. Yeah, yeah. I almost like, I really don't think anything did. And I think back, my mom even asked me at one point, she's like, did anyone, did anything ever happen to you in San Francisco in the eighties? Like so much shit was going down and everyone got away with everything. I'm like, mom, I really don't think it did. You know, like, I yeah. can't believe it. I kind of feel left out, yeah, yeah. but nothing really happened, right, right, right. you know? But I'm anyway, kidding. yeah, that's, uh, that's neither here nor there. So do you have, um, <laughs> do you, uh, do you, oh yeah. Okay. Slide down. It's a line I like. Slide down your anus. You're the shit. Yeah, dude, that was a good line, <laughs> and I didn't expect that out of you, especially for the first song on the album. Yeah, I was yeah. like, oh, he's coming in hot. Yeah, it kind of set the bar up here, and yeah. then you didn't go with any more butthole yeah, jokes yeah. throughout the rest of the no album. No more butthole after that. Yeah, although yeah. I did say, uh, 
You were sucking on my cock. Oh, uh, and this uh, that song, her love. Okay. Um, I kind of just gave it one listen. I got to go back. Yeah, to yeah, that. yeah. Right. Um, no, I ended up just. Uh, it, it's like a crooning song. I was like, okay, this what is does like crooning mean again. <laughs> Shut the. Fuck no, I'm serious. Cro- oh, crooning like crooning. a crooner, like a. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Like I, a like yeah. a swanky singer, and it's like a song. It's like a you know like an old school sort of crooner song. Right. But I was just like, but it's about sex. Right. So how am I not gonna use like sex words? Right. Oh, for sure. No. I, uh, Look, you know I do dirt nasty. I'm all about it. Oh, I was yeah, just yeah. like, whoa, this is like me doing like a dope like rock ballad or like a you know like a uh, you know, like your music. You be like, right, wait, Sai right. has this in. Right, right, Where right. does this come from? You know? right, right, right. So I think you know. I mean, I and I you know I know you well enough. Like we're not like homies, but I know you well enough to to could tell that you had like the hip hop in you. But I wonder how like fans out there are gonna take this. You know yeah. what I mean? You know, people are just so quick to put you in a box, right? Oh, That's the man. coolest thing you could yeah. do is like fuck people's heads up and be yeah. like, wait, he, you know what I mean? It's uh, the most fun, it's the, it's the best thing you can do for yourself artistically yeah. is like break your brand and destroy your brand because yeah. then it forces regeneration. Yeah. And then, yeah, and then I think also for, for your fans in a way to like, you know, break, help, like, you know, I don't know, breaking brains, like that's what, that's what psychedelics do, right? right. That's like the, the cool transcendent experience. So I don't know, I hope people, Dig it. I'm sure some people will be like, uh, this is not the, this is not that happy, happy, joy, joy, sort of hippie right. thing that I'm used to. And, uh, you know, this is, this is not that cool, but, um, well, you got to surprise them. That's what I'm saying. I think I it's know. great. I think it's more important to stay alive creatively. I just did a kid's album, not to make it about me. I really got to work on that, but I want to make this a conversation more than an interview. So I just was like, okay, I did all the suck my dick, cocaine, dumb shit I could do. So I was sitting around like, what could I do totally different? I'm like, dude. I'm going to do a children's album where it's all morally correct. And instead of dirt nasty, I'm squeaky clean. Mm. And I finished it and I sold it to this animation company. We're animating it right now. And I did. It's the first thing I can play my mom that I'm proud of because my mom's always like, oh, this dirt nasty thing. Everyone's quoting your shit. It's so (laughs) gross. So now I did a kid's album and I just flipped it on its head. And it was so fun to do something completely different. It's still kind of rap. It's like morally correct and there's yeah. good lessons in it and eat healthy and put that's your phone away. I'll play some of it for you. I think you, you dig I, I it. I wanted to I do a kid's, kid's uh, I, that's how I wanted, I was like, what do we do with Edward Sharp? Maybe, maybe Edward Sharp becomes like this Saturday morning cartoon. Dude, dude that, you know I saying? mean, it sounds like it already. Edward Sharp kind of feels like a, Edward Sharp in the Magnetic Zero. Totally. It sounds like a kid's yeah. show. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so still, are you still doing the Edward Sharp Magnetic Zero stuff? Obviously. Yeah, yeah, yeah we're making a new album this oh, year. Cool. cool. Yeah. I apologize. I keep going to my phone. I just no, need to do this. Yeah, okay. On the song, I smoke, you say that you smoke just, you say, I smoke just to remember you. Yeah. I'm uh, actually talking about cigarettes. Oh, yeah. Cause okay. I, Cause okay, I don't like to... fucking smoking cigarettes, but I, but this girl would smoke cigarettes oh. and I, but then I, you know, I let it be sort of ambiguous about what it was that I was smoking. Cause I smoked weed all the time. Well, the that's what time obviously you're fucking... listening to a rap album. You're yeah. talking about, it sounds the most people will probably, so it's good. We're talking about this yeah. because I was like, wait, you smoke to remember I quit smoking weed because I forget everything. So, right. But then you also say, I smoke to forget. I think is the next line. Did you say, uh, what just to remember you. I don't really smoke, but just to remember you. Oh, I don't really smoke. That's yeah, what it was. I don't really smoke cigarettes. Well, it's like this. Yeah, it's a nasty it's habit. Fucking gross. Yeah, there's really nothing good about smoking mm-hmm. cigarettes. Uh, yeah, so um, no cigarettes, and you don't do you smoke weed occasionally. I haven't for the last month, but yeah, good. yeah. And you've done. I imagine you've done psychedelics in your life. Yes. Any amazing trans- transcendent experiences yeah, yeah, that yeah. you want to share or that you are comfortable with? And yeah, what yeah. was the psychedelic of choice? Uh, ass. I did acid yeah. once. That's it. That's it. One time. That's all I needed. Okay. That's all you need. That's yeah. It. I've done mushrooms so many times, and it's fine. And it's cool. But acid. I had this one trip. How old were you? I was 26. Okay, so this is a little while ago. Yeah, so it, and what was your experience? Where were you? Tell me. What I was in Echo Park and running around uh, Elysian, Elysian Park, that park mm-hmm. that's like an Echo Park. Yeah. And um, we took it at like 11 p.m. Who's we? Uh, well, I won't. I guess I'll oh, yeah, be, I don't be in three homies. I'm oh, sure they'd all be fine with it. Okay, no, yeah, no, you're right. Don't be two a rap. Two girls, two dudes. You're a rapper now. You can't rap. <laughs> right. And uh, right. <laughs> the, the code, code, the code is with me. And... Um, and that shit changed it. I'd always understood like, okay, I'm a spiritual being, having a human experience, uh-huh. yada, yada, all this kind of like concepts. And I meditated a lot, but I'd never been completely confronted with a visceral truth that was like, you live forever. Right? Yes. Like, you are for fucking ever. Love you know it. what I mean? And, yeah. and I really experienced that. And it was, that's the, that's the lesson we all want to fucking learn, right? right? That's like the ultimate thing. The, the big question is like, you know, and takes away so many fears of like the fear of death and all these, 
these fears that so many of our other insecurities and anxieties are all built on top of our fear of death. Social anxiety is like the fear of being removed from the group to which you belong. Someone's like, nah, you suck. And then you're gonna, you know, your DNA is like, you're gonna shiver out in the cold alone. So make sure you behave like all your homies, but otherwise, you know, you're gonna get kicked out of the group. And that's the premise of social anxiety. It all comes back to death. So when you suddenly realize that death ain't really shit, mm -hmm. It can be really fucking liberating. Yeah. Well, I'll give you credit for getting the message and hanging up the phone because most people will keep searching for that message. And it's right, like, dude, right. once you get it, you're good. And I've been guilty of that. Like I've got the message a couple times yet. I still feel like sometimes I'm looking for something else, but you know, the big messages I've got are you, you're in death. You're going to be okay. There's nothing yeah. to be afraid of. Right. Um, you're everything and nothing right. at the same time. Somehow you ain't shit, but you're also everything. Right. Uh, the, there's all the cliche shit that you've heard that you're like, ah, that, and then you're like, oh my God, it's yeah. cliche for a reason. That's yeah. the truest shit, yeah. you know, I've ever heard. And, uh, yeah, I've had, I actually didn't do LSD for 20 years and about three years ago, I did it for the first time in 20 years and I had the most profound sort of rebirth of yeah. sorts. And I just felt this, like, you know, when you hard reset your phone, yeah, it yeah. kind of operates better. Yeah, like yeah. I kind of did the hard reset on my brain and I was like, dude, this is fucking amazing. Where have I been? I'm glad I didn't do it for 20 years. Cause it's like virgin brain yeah, yeah. to those, those chemicals. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I like it better than mushrooms. I think LSD is better than mushrooms, less uh, stomach queasy, sort of a clearer. And I, I just did some really good shit. It wasn't heady at all. It wasn't like that weird paranoid. It was just, it was yeah. beautiful. Man. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So you don't see yourself doing it anytime any time in the future. I, I think I'm good on that. I've, I've microdosed. I've done the That's microdosing cool. of acid, right. uh, which is just like, you know, and microdosing of, of mushrooms. But you don't get high, you just do it no, to you, stimulate the parts you of your brain. You don't get high up. at all. Yeah, it's therapeutic doses, you know. Um, I wonder, this is a good segue into you doing, I forget what song it was, you talk about um, the hippocampus and you yeah. talk about parts of the brain, yeah. the prefrontal cortex, or you said yeah. the frontal lobe, and you Sahara talk about- and the the, yeah. And that medulla oblongata, yeah, yeah. the hippocampus. Um, do, could we talk about these regions of the brain? <laughs> yeah. So the prefrontal cortex yeah. is the neurotic part of your brain that worries about, oh, I didn't pay the bills, this and yeah. that, which can be shut down by certain forms of medicines or whatever. Yeah. So when you're talking about uh, the uh, medulla oblongata, is there a, a metaphor or are you just using these brain words? What I was just sort of, so I, it was about my suicidal sort of thoughts, which I've had since I can fucking remember, I, probably since I was five. Um, so as soon as I learned out, learned I could die, like that I was mortal, right. I was just like in a just like sort of haze of like mortality. Right. Um, and um, and I think that the you know I don't know if we all have a critic in our head or some fucking voice in our head that's like constantly talking shit, either like remnants of like parents or whatever it is. But I definitely do. And um, whatever that voice is, that's like you know gets that depressive thing where it's like you know you. you you get into like a suicidal depression type space. Um, the idea of like, you know, hunting that fucker down inside of you, mm -hmm. like a, like high noon fucking cowboy showdown really like appealed to me as like a story. So that, that song is just more about like sort of me, um, chasing that sort of shadow figure throughout the landscape of my brain. I versus I. Yeah. Yeah. You versus you. Yeah. Um, did you ever have to take any medication for that in the past? Did no, but we were talking about yeah. effects or when I, when I went, um, when I went on, uh, when I went, when I got sober, uh, the last time I, I was in a hospital for, for that, I, only, I did that twice. They put me on this thing called effects or, right. and that shit, that shit made me straight up batshit crazy. Yeah, it's within no good. twenty four hours. Yeah, that's no good. Yeah, I did it for something years ago for some. I forget why I got prescribed, and it made me just yeah. That shit wasn't yeah. right. They're like he, he basically the dude's like, have you ever are you depressed? Yeah, have you ever thought of suicide? Now I'm a person where like the thought the thoughts of suicide like if you don't if you've never considered if you've never thought about suicide. Like, I don't even know what world, like, how does that even happen? So Considering me, it's different than thinking about it, right? Yeah, That's yeah, why you're just thinking yourself. about it. I, I didn't try it. I never right. tried suicide. Yeah, of course. I'm sure uh, everyone Well, did. I kind of like tempted suicide once with an, like a, a tempted, a, a, a temptation of overdose. But like, it was different than I, you know, I haven't slipped my wrist or anything like that. But anyway, I told the dude, yeah. And he's like, okay, well, then you have to take this. Right. Take this. I took it for 24 hours. I came back to the doctor. I was like, 
dude, this, it sent me into a mania, yeah. an instant mania where I was like, <gasps> like on yeah. fire. I felt like completely removed from any sense of morality. I, I told the dude, I can't take it anymore. It's making me crazy. He goes, Oh no, that's impossible. It doesn't start working for 30 days. Just keep taking it. Oh, yeah. And then later I saw this thing on the news, Effexor is creating um, homicidal tendencies yeah, in dude. people. So no, anyway, dude. so I stopped taking, the nurses would keep giving me, I literally would like put it in my mouth and spit it out. Um, so I've never taken anything for depression like that. Um, that was my only experience. I took one pill. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. probably better you didn't. Uh, yeah. It's. I think in the West, we sort of just put a bandaid on things with like pharmaceutical pills and it's yeah. just not the answer. Uh, yeah. I imagine you seem like a strong enough, a strong willed person that could go inside and you versus you figured out before yeah. you just take some pill to fix everything. I mean, for me, depression and, um, and beauty and pain and all of that, uh, mortality, they're all wrapped up in the language of poetry, right? Like poetry is for me, um, what may, what transcends something from, oh, this is beautiful to this is poetic is the knowing that that beautiful thing is going to die. That beautiful moment is going to pass. Right. This beautiful kiss isn't going to last. That's what transfer transforms a beautiful moment into a poetic moment for me. Right. So to me, it's all part of the language of poetry and living, you know? Yeah. Yeah. No, I get it. Uh, I, I feel the same way. And yeah, you can't have, again, a cliche shit. You can't have the highs without the lows. You sort of learn to embrace it and step back. And you look at these moments where you have these lows because I've suffered from depression in the past and I'm really high or really low. And if you just step back and look at it like, okay, my life's a movie. How boring would the movie be if you're always happy? Right. You've got to have lows. Like, that's part of the deal. And yeah. then, you know, it's like, you can't have one without the other. It's like, yeah. the, again, the cliche shit, the yin, the yang. You can't have the lightness without the dark. Yeah. So as long as you can kind of step outside yourself and look at it, You'll be all right. When you're younger, I feel like you can't do that as much. You don't have the tools, you know, uh, I feel like you get older and you could sort of remove yourself from yourself. So you just, learn that you, that you survive things, right? You're like, Oh, okay. I've, you end up surviving and you realize, okay, this breakup or this thing or that, this change, I'm going to live through it. You know what I mean? And you learn that change is life and without yeah. change. I mean, someone said to me once, they were like, man, you changed. And I was like, I hope so. Yeah. Imagine if I was still the same dude you knew 20 years ago, exactly. like still like, yo, let's go get the bitches at the club and smoke weed. It's like, yeah. no, you change. Yeah, yeah. Changing's a good thing. Yeah. So I've always been a, yeah, I think that's just literally the meaning of life. Um, oh yeah. What did you mean by the, uh, you, I heard you say on the new album, uh, fake is monogamy. Fake ass monogamy. Oh, fake ass monogamy. Yeah. Okay. What do you mean by that? Because I have a big, a strong opinion on monogamy uh, and how it's not hardwired in us. I mean, dog, do like, so we have, we have these two competing forces, it seems, like within us, or at least I do. We have the dream, and then we have sort of like the reality. And we want the reality to become the dream, and the dream to become the reality. Um, but, you know... My experience previously with relationships, um, with monogamous relationships, is that the one thing that was never really, ever really entirely spoken was that we're both going to be attracted to other people. Right. That was never spoken. It's always just sort of gauzed over with like, you know, syrupy language. And then you just kind of like, oh, yeah, that person's cute, but haha, and turn into a joke. And it's never really addressed fucking head on that like, yeah, I'm going to want to literally just like have sex with other people and you're going to want to actually have sex with other people, but we're not going to talk about that. And you're going to say that I'm the only, you only have eyes for me. I only have eyes for you. And that lie that most re monogamous relationships is, are built on just drove me crazy eventually where I was like, this feels fraudulent. Yeah. So that's, that's really what I was sort of talking about. I do think it's possible now having experienced a more recent relationship to have that honest conversation and choose to be monogamous, but to have that open sort of honesty happening. Um, but that shit is tough, man. And, and talk about jealousy and those various things, you know, playing with open relationships, all that kind of thing. But um, it, at the time I had broken up with like my main big dream, this dream of the family, my kid and baby mama, and we're going to be together forever. That dream that we all kind of grew up with, that dream had just shattered. And so I was, a dr and, and with her, we'd never really spoken head on about these kind of things. And so we kind of had the whole thing was kind of predicated on not a lie, but on uh, unspoken truth. 
lack of communication. It's yeah. so it's so crazy how how simple things would be if out the gate you just communicated better because you're right. Everybody's going to we're, we're not a monogamous species, but it's all about sacrifice and if you meet someone you care enough about, you'll kind of realize that oh, you might see someone attractive. The thing is for someone like you or me, and I don't mean to sound arrogant, is that we might have more options than most human men. So I've been to therapy and discussed this and and you know, you can say maybe they don't understand it because they're a 60-year-old, you know, heady shrink that maybe never had the options. Um, but just on a psychological level, it's, uh, it's like Chris Rock said, uh, Chris Rock had a joke. He's like, uh, what was it? Um, he said, a man is only as faithful as his options, which is so true, <laughs> right? It's so true. It's like someone in yeah. Kansas city who's with their wife and they're not, right. around, they're going to be a happily married man. But when you're out here, we're talking about LA and the energy yeah. and the options, you know, I go to cheesecake factory and I see 500 <laughs> options and I'm overwhelmed. I don't want 500 right, options. Right, I want right. seven options. Right, right, right. So I think on a human biological evolutionary procreative level we are wired to obviously like we've been talking this forever like spread your seed but, but you know you get older and you know i tried the open relationship thing with an ex-girlfriend and then i couldn't do that either yeah that was sucked because i'd be sitting on the couch and i'm like oh cool she's gonna let me do my thing and she could do her thing and then like thursday at 7 p.m rolls around you sit on the couch alone and you're just like oh dude like she doesn't answer her phone and now your mind goes to other <laughs> places then like, yeah. oh, i'm a jealous man like you yeah, know john yeah. lennon yeah who's in the beatles so yeah, it's yeah. tricky stuff, dude. Yeah. And you're a heady guy. I feel yeah. like you're a smart, intellectual human man. Yeah, right? yeah. Well, and then that and that actually can be problematic. Yeah, because you can overthink this shit. And <laughs> yeah, it's fucking. It's pretty. It's pretty wild, man. The blue pill, red know. pill thing. You know. Yeah. Like, do, would you rather just not know and be oblivious? It would yeah. be a lot easier. But then, do, don't you feel that it feeds your art to be a, a someone who's analytical and sort of a, a weirdo? And I mean that in the best way. Yeah. I mean, in the sense that you have these deeper thoughts yeah but sometimes i wish you could just shut it off yeah but effects is not the answer nah yeah yeah i don't know what the answer is with the relate i think honesty having those conversations that's the start and then i don't even know where it goes but i know that that's that's level two yeah you know what i mean having those conversations is level two Oh, you mean level two within the relationship? Within any, like level two for me as in terms of approaching a relationship right. with honesty. That's yeah. level one is like where you're all up in the dream and you're trying to make reality fit the dream. But then, you know, but then you're lacking a bunch of truth and then you end up suffering because the truth isn't like out in the open. You just might, didn't you have a song Truth? Yeah. Yeah, that was a beautiful song. I remember that one. That one got heavy rotation in my, uh, I think at the time you put that out, what was my car? I remember driving around. What year was that song? That was like 2011. Okay, so 2011, in 2011, yeah, my Subaru. Yeah. yeah. That was my Subaru jam. Yeah. Yeah. That's <laughs> how I could usually remember music is by what car I had in that time and kind of remember driving around. You still have a car? I do have a car. Yeah. I actually am about to get a Subaru again. So since that Subaru, I had a Prius for the last 10 years and now I'm about to get a Subaru. Dope. Yeah, I like yeah. Subaru. Subaru. Subarus are great. They're fun, they're good, they're, they're manly, yet they handle business. Yeah. We're, and you, so you're in LA just doing the album stuff for now? Are you yeah. back to New Orleans? Back to, now I'm gonna pick up my daughter in Chicago, cause that, you know, that's where she, we split our, she splits her time between New Orleans and uh, Michigan. Oh, oh, Michigan yeah. or, oh, so you fly well, to Michigan, Chicago is the closest airport. Oh, I got it, got it. Yeah. Uh, and was baby mama in Michigan? Why is baby she Baby mama's in Michigan. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And so she, is she gonna be in LA with, does she like LA? Uh, no, that neither of them have spent much time in LA because I'm always in New Orleans. Yeah. All, all of Earth, of my kids' friends are in New Orleans. Right. So that's New Orleans life. Much better place to bring up a child, dude. This is too much here. Like, it's too much. I'm sorry. This is not a place for like a child to grow up. You like, know what I, I like? You know what the most important thing to me is the DIY versus like total everything being served on a platter. Like in New Orleans, everything is fucking DIY. I mean, like almost everything. If you want to have fun, it's usually some DIY shit. Mardi Gras, total DIY. You right. have to put together your thing. Right. Like making something out of nothing. Right. Not just being served your entertainment. And um, and I think that that's the most jarring thing about moving to New Orleans is for me, it was just learning that, you know, it's not, it's not, it's not about like going out to a club where there's shit already there for you or going to a movie or whatever it is. It's like about going into the street, strapping some weird fucking branch onto your bicycle so that you look like a goblin and then like chasing fools with flashlights, like just being inventive, like yeah. staying kind of like a kid. And, um, and for her to grow up in like a creative space like that, I think is really dope. Have mm -hmm. you done Burning Man? I feel like you, I have done Burning Man. Did you like it? I loved it. Uh, except I love it. I, 
I can't take much of the culture of Burning Man. So like my best experiences of Burning Man was I went off by myself. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so I've only gone twice and I go by myself. Yeah. And I have this immersive play the ground experience like a kid again. Yeah. I feel the most like a kid I've ever felt. Yeah. Because I had this weird stigma about what it was and the people that went. And I was yeah. like, I learned a big lesson when I went. I was like, oh, I was just wrong about what yeah. this is. I thought it was a festival where people, yeah. this is actually a world, an immersive yeah. world. And the and most that I had, yeah. yes, that's what, that's what made me think of it. And the most fun I had is when I was, with, I go alone and I meet friends and I click up and do stuff. But whenever I just ride my bike alone and I get into the most incredible experiences, yeah. uh, did stand up comedy on LSD by That's myself right. at a comedy tent. Yeah. And, and it was like one of the highlights of my life was just yeah. doing stand up in a tent in Burning Man for 12 people That's on fun. acid. Amazing. Like that was fun. That's, That's the amazing. kind of shit you get into out there. Uh, you record that? No, uh, you know, you got that. It's interesting. Another thing I like about Burning Man is. You wouldn't dare pull your phone out and start right, recording. Right, right. Right. It's kind of like put that shit away. This is right, one right, week right, away right, from right. that. That's the true. phones don't work, That's and true. people always say, "Like, yeah. did you?" I'm like, hey, that was the beauty of it. It's just for me and those yeah. twelve people. You know what I mean? Like, it's not captured forever. Um, yeah. Another question I had for you is, uh, you uh, you said you created Edward Sharp when you kind of lost your identity, right? Uh, mm-hmm. I saw that. I just read that in the yeah. interview that you had. Yeah. Do you feel that if anything, because people listening to this album might say. Oh, he kind of, because their idea of you is the character sort of that you created when you lost your identity. Yeah. So there's so many layers to like perception of what people think. Yeah. Is this losing your identity or is this actually going back to more of you for real? Or? I mean, to be honest, to be blatantly, blatant, blatant, like this is, this is, I, I, I made music almost exactly like this shit when I was 19, 20, 21. This is the music that I... This is the music that I just made. Like I'm a this robot shit? Kind pre of? I'm a robot, right. yeah. And and I feel so much more, in a way, expressed now that this album is out in terms of just like who I, like what's underneath all those layers. Like all those layers are great. They're explorations, they're interesting, they're necessary for me. I, I found them musically inspiring. But this is like what happens when I'm not thinking about who the fuck my audience is, when I'm just doing what I was raised sort of like the tools I was raised with and um, what happens when I'm in a studio alone, basically. So it's cool. And in a way, it's not, I just avoid saying it because it sounds corny, like this is really me. This is the album that's like really me, but this kind of is the album that's like more me than, than I've ever put out. Yeah, that's in, uh, what you just said about you know, when, when you just do something for you instead of attaching yourself to a result is sort of, yeah. to me, that's the magic. It's like, I, f- I forget who said this. I think Picasso said that mean, the purpose, the meaning of life is to create art and the purpose of life is to share it. Right. Mm-hmm. That makes sense to me on a lot yeah. of levels. Right. I, I, I live for making a beat at home, doing a silly thing on it, shooting a little video and I just do it. And if I laugh or I like it, then yeah. I'm satisfied with it. And I like to share it with people and I'm not attaching a result to like, Oh, I hope people like this. And that's where social media kind of has skewed this uh, creative process in that like, I'm guilty of this, this trap of, Oh, I made something that I think's funny. It didn't get as many likes as my last one. Yeah, it's like, yeah. fuck all that dude. Did yeah. I like it? And yeah. is it resonate with me? Yeah. So I think that's important and, and not to sound all arts, but in the creative process that's the magic is when it's for you not yeah. the audience because yeah. that's what they is that's attractive. when you make the best shit when you're not thinking about the audience I think I mean they teach yeah. in school now like with writing and whatnot. like you have to be thinking about your audience who's your audience because they're teaching you the sort of pragmatic practical approach to business and yeah. capitalizing on previous successes of other artists and what did they do and then just basically do what they did but with your little twist but that shit is not rewarding actually in the long run and, and, and it's not really that sustainable unless you approach the whole thing like a business and then what kind of fucking reward do you end up getting anyway so yeah yeah i agree uh yeah it's yeah, it, once you said business, then that's where you lose me because it, the, but the reality is it is a business. And if you want to sell records, then you got to play the game. But then art and business, it's almost like when you create, when you're dealing on the creative level and then you have suits, like whether it be an agent or like a, a label and they try to get creative and give you feedback. It's like, no, dude, it, it gets so fucked. Yeah. I've seen so many projects suffer from the suits getting involved creatively yeah. with the artist. You know what I mean? I'm I've, sure you run into I've that. I've had that. I mean, yeah. you got Brian Link constantly telling you, no, A chord, A chord. <laughs> yeah. No, with the, with I'm a Robot, I had that, man. I had a, I had a producer who came up to me and said, um, the second producer we had, um, right after our first rehearsal, I'm le- letting him out the door and he turns to me, his name's David Bendis, and he turns to me and he goes, look, man, 
you know what cool albums are? The ones that sell. And he just like said that to me and basically walked off. And we weren't even in the middle of a conversation about it. He just like sensed that I wanted to do something sort of personal and artful. And he was just like trying to like kill that. And we ended up making an album with him. It was the worst fucking experience of my life um, creatively and uh, and nearly broke me. Like I almost just was like, fuck music. You know what I mean? Uh, right before the Edward Sharp shit. So I'm glad that did happen. Yeah. Uh, also, I love this song. Was it Home? Is that the name of the song? Yeah. I saw it in an NFL commercial. Yeah. And in a weird way, it was like, oh, they came to you. I know you didn't make, see, that's exactly what we're talking about. You didn't make that song like, I hope the NFL picks this no. up. But yet that somehow yeah. that was a perfect synonymous tune for like right. the home game or whatever right, they meant. Right, right. I forget what they meant. But right. I remember seeing that going, oh, dude, it doesn't get bigger than that. Right. You just got the NFL. Right. Yet it couldn't be more opposite than an NFL kind of song. Right. So those kind of ones are cool, I think, because they it was are cool, fortuitous. Man. You weren't like yeah, designing well, you just happen on some shit and you're yeah. feeling so geeked out about it and then you realize oh shit people are gonna like this yep that's so fun i uh, I, I really don't mean to keep bringing it back to myself but this is my lesson is i did a song with mickey avalon and andre legacy called my dick right yeah. that was our, I remember our that song. yeah it was like our, cle- our, our our great song yeah it was our sort of our yeah <laughs> it was your song yeah it was that's our, your it was song. home and we made it on my sp- Five dollar Canal Street Kobe microphone with a sock over it on a fucking MP beat that I made in five minutes, and we were just fucking around and we wrote it in an hour. The whole thing was conceptualized, written and recorded in two hours, and I almost didn't put it out. Like, and then it turns out that was the song that went platinum. Of course, it was the one that we were like, "This is the dumbest shit ever." And then Mickey gets signed to Interscope. They put us in the studio with Dr. Luke and Kesha and Katy Perry and all these huge, Perry Farrell, all these big names, and the magic was gone. Yeah. Because it happened when we weren't trying. Right, right, right. Time and time again, I keep learning, don't try. And that's what Bukowski meant. I don't know if you've ever seen Bukowski's grave. I'm talking yeah. about Charles Bukowski. Had, he left two words on his tomb, don't try, with boxing gloves. Mm. And at first I'm like, what does he mean, don't try? You gotta try. I'm like, mm. oh, I get what he means. Yeah, yeah. He means don't try. Yeah, don't try yeah. and satisfy some purpose, yeah, like, or whatever. Right? Yeah. Some some audience, yeah. So you weren't trying to make the NFL. Yeah. That. You weren't trying to appeal to anyone with this rap album, and yeah. that's when the magic happens. Yeah. And then it also falls under that umbrella to me, is the flow state, which I'm sure you're familiar yeah. with. You know, when you're creating and making music and you get out of the prefrontal cortex, and, all comes to, and you shut up the neurotic part of your brain and you just flow, it's so magic, and that's what attracts other people to you, is when yeah. they see someone who's good at their craft, when and you're it's free, like Steph Curry's hitting yeah, threes, yeah. He's in this flow state. He ain't yeah. trying. He's just doing it. Yeah. Or when you see Jimi Hendrix killing it, he ain't yeah. trying. He's just in the zone. Yeah. And there's something attractive about that. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. It's everything. It's everything. It's everything. There was there was actually a dude when, uh, in New Orleans, permission. I was going towards this idea of like permission, giving yourself permission, giving, and then as an artist, giving everyone else permission. When I'm on stage, I guess if I could boil down what my purpose is on stage is to try and get to a place of permission where like I'm giving myself permission to just fucking be not to try, but just to be me. And by doing that, I'm giving everyone else permission right. to also be themselves. Like you're creating space, like a safe space, by right, giving right. yourself permission. Yeah. That's like what a shaman does. They're holding space. You're holding space basically. Yeah. 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 Um, do you feel fatherhood has been good for the arts? Has it kind of settled you down? Like, you know, they say settled down. Has it settled you down in any way to, does it um, affect the art process? I mean, I think that that I think that the way that it's affected the art is that um, I have less time, and so the shit that I do has to be sort of stuff that's really coming from my my heart because I, I have less time to just like sort of fuck around and and I don't know and sort of do masturbatory type shit, mm. but like. Um, but like really just like, you know, there's this, it, it's sort of a cliche too, but like, it's back to this trying thing. I don't know if you ever experienced, but you'd be working, 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 and I'll be putting out a bunch of shit, writing a bunch of shit, trying, 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 like high volume output. But then the results are just kind of like, you know, there's a song like this and it's cool. And there's a bunch of songs that I like, they're all right. But if I'm sort of relaxed and I come at it like more like, all right. Here I am, boom, and, and, I, and I lay something down. And I might only be working two hours a day instead of 12, but the, the stuff that's coming out is really more flowing through me. And I think that, I guess that's the grounding quality is like, 
I'm sitting there playing with my kid. I'm giving love. I'm receiving love. I'm being honest with a person. I'm trying to be my best self with a person. And then I walk into the studio with that sort of vibration, um, sort of trying to be more of a vessel. Um, I don't know. It's, it's, it's cool. It's a little different. And then I guess the other way is like, you know, um, it's like how, you know, you have this other little person in the world and it connects you to the next generation and, and the idea of like what you're, what you're contributing to fucking life and all that kind of thing. Um, I don't know. It affects you in like really subtle ways, you know? Um, at first it just affects you because you're fucking losing sleep and you, and then you start, like I, I ended up with like crazy, crazy insomnia. That's that, what all my friends say. That That's thought, the hardest part is the first year of just yeah. not sleeping. I mean, I thought I was going to, I thought I needed, I, I tried all these different like drugs to try and just like get myself to sleep. It was like that kind of stress where like, you know that it's ruining your relationship because you're not sleeping and now you need a fucking nap when you should be pitching in, right. but then you got to get to the studio or you got to go on tour now. It's so stressful. Um, that was a really fucking weird, stressed out time in my life actually. But I think, I think the cool thing about a kid to me is that all that shit doesn't take first place. The only thing that's in first place is your kid. And you could be fucking like on your last limb and it's still about your kid. You know what I mean? And, and doing stuff for this sort of like higher purpose. And, um, I don't know. It's cool. I still, I'm still, you know, working it out and figuring it out, but I know that being, having a relationship with my kid that I think is better improving on the relationship that my parents had with me mm. is so fucking important to me. and so cool to be like this kid and me are tight. Like I'm not doing some weird shit to like fuck this kid up. Um, I'm, you know, I'm trying not to, we're friends. Like if I can improve even a little bit on it, it's so cool to think that like she has like, you know, a friend in me. Yeah. It's so dope. Yeah. That's cool. Uh, I imagine, you know, I don't have any kids, but I could imagine again, it's gotta be the most selfless act you could do and kind of puts everything in perspective. And we obviously have this ego we live up to and kind of this persona and this mask we wear. So I imagine kind of strips that away and brings you down to basics and kind of gets rid of all Dude, the bullshit to have a, to have a kid, especially when they're younger, the way they look at you and the, like the way they behold you is like, they have no, they don't have a sense of irony. They don't have sarcasm. They don't have like judgment. They're just like looking at you, beholding you with like basically with love or right. whatever it is. And it forces you in my experience to basically get up to their level to resonate That's in dope. that same space. So you're not yeah. looking at them with that shit. And then all of a sudden you're in this like baby state and it's really like, it's really, te it teaches you a shit pile about like, just even like how to behave yeah. or like what you can behave like, like what the pinnacle could be, you know, That's cause you cool. don't want to like put that vibe onto this kid. So you yeah. try and like approach their vibe. That's cool. I never thought about it that way. You're the first person to say that. It's almost like you, you would think that you got to put on this wall to let them see what it's like. But if you like mirror them and go down the other level, you're being a better version of yourself because you're being like the raw truth. Yeah. Yeah. You're trying to be pure. pure. It's like you're trying to reach that purity. Yeah. I love it. All right. So um, let's tell people where they can find the album. Yeah. Obviously, it's it's on all it's fucking down yeah, everywhere format, you look. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's What's also the same on Bandcamp. Band oh, Bandcamp. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So it's on all platforms, Bandcamp. Yeah. What's the single going to be? Uh, well, we have a single fluid right now. Okay. We're trying to figure out what we're going to play on on various things. But we got to, you know, it's kind of chock full of singles in a way or yeah i was gonna songs. say there's a few that jump out that could yeah. is it gold is that one of the songs that was one of the songs we have uh uh stronger we got a uh, press fluid play. press play all these all these sort of um it's more like a playlist of of sort of singles but it has this yeah. arc and so it's an album i love the album everyone out there go go get it yeah. uh and and uh good luck on the, is it colbert you're gonna be doing colbert when yeah. is that coming when That's is on that? the 10th so okay so this will them. this might but this will live forever so people yeah. listening go look for that go on youtube or whatever because i'm yeah. gonna be doing now now you can in regit this come out later i'm gonna do something that i think i've never seen i've never seen but i think it's never happened um i'm gonna wear a green suit like a lime green suit and they're going to key it out. I'm going to be a green screen. My suit is, and it's going to be like, yeah. Um, floating head. Yeah. Floating head. And then also if you're listening to this and you want to ask me 
any more questions about any of this stuff, um, you can go to tuners.io uh, and uh, download Tuners because Tuners is an app. This podcast will be on it. And then basically it's a place where you can like send each other voicemails, voice memos, like and create threads. And we can all sort of just talk about stuff. Um, and if you have any questions, I'll be there to answer. Yeah, you, you were showing me that app earlier. It's yeah. uh, so people could find it on the app store on their iPhone or whatever. It's called, how do you yeah. spell it? Tuners, like T U N E R S. Okay, cool. Yeah. yeah, I'm gonna get it too. Uh, you were showing yeah. it to me. It's really cool stuff. And uh, thanks for your time. Alex thanks, Hubert, you're the man. Appreciate right. it. Oh, I should have psyched you right there. Oh! Thank God. You're really oh, changing, bro. I'm better with you. God damn it. I don't wanna grow up. Thanks, bro.